This slide's presentation will cover mental status te testing, perception, and communication. Now, last year in CP3, we covered mental status testing just a little bit. So the beginning of this slide's presentation is going to be a little bit of a review. And you've also covered a little bit of communication last year in ICAL, as well as neuroscience. Uh, we talked about different uh, problems with speech. And so that'll be a little bit of a review for you as well. And then finally, um, apraxia was covered a little bit last year in iCal, so that, that's also going to be a review. So I'm going to go through those, those concepts relatively quickly, and if you have any questions about them, please go back and look at the material that we covered last year. So starting out uh, with mental status testing, like I said, last year we covered level of consciousness, so I'm just going to breeze right through that. Other things that we need to talk about are attention, cognition, and finally we'll get to communication and perception. Right now, a little review on levels of consciousness. If you remember, uh, there are levels, terms to describe levels of consciousness, that, and those are listed here. For the most part, you're either alert, lethargic, obtundus, obtunded, stuporous, comatose, or delirious. All these words should be familiar to you except for delirious. So let's go ahead and cover that now. A delirious patient. Uh, typically, this is going to be a person who is ventilated uh, or has been on ventilation, is just arousing from a coma, possibly. Uh, delirium has been associated in the acute care setting with um, acute respiratory distress. And it's going to represent a change in the patient's cognition and perception of the environment. A delirious patient can kind of go in and out of delirium, and uh, they can possibly hallucinate. And take a second and pause this PowerPoint video and watch the video that's embedded in the slide to hear this woman's description of what it was like to be delirious. Now, switching over from level of consciousness to mental status testing again. We're moving on to attention. There are four types of attention that you need to be aware of. These are sustained attention, focus, selective attention, alternating attention, and divided attention. I'm going to go over each of these types of attention in the slides that follow, starting with sustained attention. Another name for sustained attention is vigilance, and it's literally the ability to attend to a task for a long period of time without losing either interest or focus. In the picture on the right, you can see that this individual was doing homework and then they ended up on Facebook. So doing his homework did not, was not able to sustain his attention. Next is focused or selective attention. And this is the ability to attend to the task despite the presence of distractions. Now, this is going to be important. Uh, this kind of attention might be altered in a patient suffering from a stroke uh, or a brain injury or a lot of other different neurological conditions, but a lot of times patients have difficulty with this. Um, if there's a lot of distractions present, they can't pay attention and do what you're asking them to do. In the picture on the right, you can see that the individual on the left is able to read a book despite all the noise in the background and the guy talking very loudly on the cell phone and the dog barking at him. So she has very good focused or selective attention. She's able to focus her attention specifically on reading, despite the presence of distractions. Next is alternating attention, and this is just the ability to switch focus between two tasks. The important thing to know for alternating attention is that the tasks require different cognitive demands. Both tasks are relevant to the environment, but you can't fully pay attention to all tasks at the same time because they have different cognitive demands. 
In the picture, you can see that there's an individual driving and she's texting on her cell phone and drinking a cup of coffee all at the same time. My hope would be that most of her attention was in toward driving as opposed to texting and drinking a cup of coffee. But realize, even though she's driving and drinking a cup of coffee, uh, drinking a cup of coffee is going to become more automatic because that's something that drinking is just a, a normal reaction that, that you do all the time. Um, it's a procedural task, so it, you've done it over and over, and it doesn't require a whole lot of your attention. Texting, well, it's going to require your vision and a little bit more attention, but my hope is that most of the attention is going toward driving. Next, we have divided attention. Another word for divided attention is going to be multitasking. And this is going to be the ability to focus on two tasks simultaneously. An example of that would be, you know, doing your homework at the same time that you're uh, watching television. Uh, your ability to divide your attention equally between two tasks is going to be dependent on the person. Some people have an ability to multitask, multitask better than others. But anytime you're multitasking overall, you're not using all of your brain toward any one particular task. If your brain is divided, your ability to multitask is going to be limited. As far as testing attention, if you're if the person seems to be paying attention to you okay and um, you just want to see if they're having a problem, then there's some general tests you can do, and that's to spell the word world backward. Um, you can ask the person to count backward from 100 by sevens, or they can try and say the months of the year backward. If they're having difficulty with the, the general test um, and you want to specifically look at sustained attention, you can do what's known as the A test, and that's where if the, you start reading a series of letters, you instruct the patient to either raise their hand or, or tap the table or say something every time you say the word A. Uh, if you're specifically testing for divided attention, you can do something like the walking while talking test or um, the timed up and go test with a cognitive demand, such as uh, carrying a glass of water or saying something out loud or counting backward while the person is walking and compare the difference in the person's time. Again, if the person appears attentive to whatever you're doing, then it might not be important to go into specific tests of te testing attention. It's just when you notice that the person might be having difficulty that you really want to further test their attention. Back to the mental status testing information. Um, we've so far covered level of consciousness as well as attention. And uh, finally, we're on cognition. One of the simplest ways for testing cognition that you have been exposed to is determining if the person is oriented. If you remember, uh, ordinarily you're looking to see if the person is alert and oriented times one, two, three, or four. Uh, in other words, to themselves, to their location, to the time. If a person is not oriented, you might also want to go into more detailed cognition testing. And what is cognition? It's, it's just the ability to process, sort, retrieve, and manipulate inputs. Inputs from all kinds of sensory stimuli, whether it be somatosensory stimuli or auditory or visual stimuli. And specifically, when you're worried about a person's cognition, you can specifically test for memory, something known as executive functions. You can ask them to do some simple calculations, and you could also test their ability to reason abstractly. Memory can be divided into immediate recall, short-term memory, and long-term memory. And immediate recall is going to be uh, to ask the person to remember three objects, a blue book and ball, uh, then they can immediately repeat it back to you. Short-term memory, uh, you can wait five or 10 minutes 
uh, while you're doing some other examination processes and then come back to the patient and say, do you remember what those three words are that I asked you to remember? And that's an example of short-term memory. Long-term memory would be remembering an event a long time ago in the past, something from the person's childhood or maybe months gone by. And then long-term memory is further divided into declarative memory and procedural memory. You should know that declarative memory is involves the hippocampus very specifically. There are other parts of the brain involved, but in the absence of the hippocampus, that person will have very little declarative memory. And procedural memory involves mostly the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. This is important because uh, procedurally, if, if you're trying to teach a procedural task to a person with a cerebellar injury, it's going to be it's going to require a whole lot of repetition. It is possible, but it's going to require a whole lot of repetition under a variety of different conditions. And if you're expecting a person who had a, a stroke or a, some sort of brain injury that affected their hippocampus, you should be aware that their memory is going to be very limited. Now, moving on from memory to uh, the next heading under cognition, this is known as executive functioning. Executive function has essentially four components. Those are volition, planning, propulsive action, and effective performance. Difficult to describe, but patients with that have exhibit problems with executive function, function have difficulty um, planning, uh, sequencing, uh, keeping keeping on task. Okay, task task is and they are also going to be have difficulty monitoring themselves and correcting their behavior. They may realize that things aren't going exactly as they want it to, but but they don't have the ability to self monitor. To get a better feel for exactly what executive function is, pause this PowerPoint and watch the video under the picture. So far, we've covered these three. Now let's move on to perception. Now there are just three different categories of perceptual deficits that we're going to talk about. And these include neglect, that often goes along with something known as anosognosia, followed by apraxia, and then agnosia. The next several slides are going to take each of these categories and talk about them in more detail. Neglect is essentially the inability to process stimuli from one side of the body. Now this stimuli may be visual, uh, it can be sensory, uh, or you just might not be aware of the whole one side of the world. Presentation of patients with neglect is Pretty bizarre when you first notice it, but the, you know these these people really have difficulty with severe neglect, even bringing their eyes to midline. Another kind of body image problem that you may see is known as anosognosia, and anosognosia can often go along with neglect, and in its inability to recognize the severity of the deficits. The picture here shows an example that comes directly from the video, and this is a, an examination of a patient with severe neglect. The video does a good job, I think, of talking about neglect and, and kind of demonstrating things that you might see in a patient. However, it uses something known as the NIH stroke scale and just a portion of the NIH stroke scale, um, scale grading. Don't worry about the NIH stroke scale for the purpose of this presentation, but what I want you to do is pause the PowerPoint and just watch the video and get a feel for the kinds of neglect that you might see. On to the next kind of perceptual deficits known as apraxia. Apraxia it isn't as obvious a deficit when you first start working with a person, but the more times you see it in patients, the, the more easy it is to recognize. For now, you should be aware that apraxia is the inability to perform a voluntary movement on command. The video under the picture just shows the demonstration of a patient with apraxia who's trying to use a sliding board. Take a minute and pause the video 
and um, watch the short video clip on a, with a patient trying to transfer using a sliding board that has apraxia. On to the last perceptual deficit that we'll talk to talk about, and this is known as agnosia. Agnosia is the inability to recognize objects with one or more of your senses, even though you can recognize the object with other of your senses. The video that is shown in this slide is has a, a little bit of language at the very, very end. So I apologize if, if you're offended by um, language, but it, it's something that you will be exposed to over and over in the clinic, especially in patients that have had a brain injury. So take a minute and watch this short video clip and see if you can get a better understanding of a patient with agnosia. Okay, moving on, back to mental status testing, the overall format where you've looked at these four things and we're on to the last component, which would be communication. There are just two basic types of communication disorders that, that you need to worry about here. The first is dysarthria and the second is aphasia. I'll take the next couple of PowerPoint slides are going to take each of these in turn and talk about them in a little bit more detail. Dysarthria is due to a muscle dysfunction that leads to impaired verbal communication. Patient may present with a problem breathing, a problem with phonation, a problem with articulation, or resonance. Take a moment and pause this video PowerPoint to watch the short video clip on a patient with dysarthria. The last communication area we're going to talk about is known as aphasia. Aphasia is a dominant hemisphere injury. Approximately 90% of the population have their left hemisphere as their dominant hemisphere. This has nothing to do with handedness. Uh, some left-handed people still have the left hemisphere as the dominant hemisphere. It just depends on the person. With aphasia, there's an impairment in the expression and or understanding of language. Spoken words, written words, or both may be impaired. And the person might have difficulty speaking, difficulty reading. Uh, you can usually use a, a picture chart to kind of get some, some information from the person. Um, they might be able to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. You don't know until you try. You also want to check for consistency in their ability to, to answer commands or follow commands properly or understand your question. In general, there's three different types of aphasia. First is Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia, and global aphasia. With Wernicke's aphasia, Speech is going to be fluent in the patient, but the meaning of the words that they're saying is completely lost. Another word for Wernicke's aphasia is that patient talks with word salad. Um, they might say the car is a tree or they, they have a meaning in their head, but they're not going to be able to, to say it properly to you. Oftentimes with Wernicke's aphasia, there's also a, a problem understanding what you are saying. Don't really know what it sounds like to the person, but if you at, if you try and give them a command, they're typically not able to follow it. Take a moment and pause this PowerPoint and watch the short video clip of a patient with Wernicke's aphasia. The last kind of aphasia that we're going to talk about is known as Broca's aphasia. And this is the impairment in expression of language. These patients have a very, very difficult time getting the words out. They understand what you're saying, but they can't, and they have the thought in their head to say something, but they're physically unable to do it. This patient population, in my experience, is, is uh, suffers from severe frustration. They, they, really, they really have difficulty expressing what they want and that they understand and it takes an awfully long time to have the speech expression come back if it comes back at all. 
The other problem with Broca's aphasia is that the, somehow in our society, if you can't talk, people think you're stupid. But the, the thing is, these people are not stupid. They're very intelligent people and that a stigma is associated with them because they have this problem with speech production. And take a moment and pause the PowerPoint and watch this video of a patient with Broca's aphasia.